Let's turn to 1 John chapter 1. the purpose of salvation is that we might come into fellowship with our heavenly father and jesus christ it's not to go to heaven see there are so many wrong motives with which we can come to christ and uh, if i come with a wrong motive i can't be sure of my salvation and i think that is the problem with many people they have come to the lord with looking for something else you can come to the lord for food for healing that's fine he'll accept you but then you, that must be something that moves on to finding deliverance from sin and if that if our main desire and i want to say this straight to all of you if your main desire in your life is not to be free from sin in your life i want to tell you that i would doubt whether you're really born again and i have a feeling that many people uh in our cfc churches are not born again i've said that even in bangalore because so many people come to us because it's a nice church to belong to first of all there's no collection all rich people are very happy to come to this church because there's no offering nobody forces you to pay 10% imagine if you go to some church and you're a very rich man and the pastor asks you to pay 10% you won't like it you'd rather come to this church such people are not saved they're just covetous greedy people who are only trying to take advantage of christ and they'll be lost and their judgment will be very severe in hell but if a person wants to be free from sin in his life such a person can find salvation so you know jesus said he did not come to call righteous holy people he came to call sinners not sinners he came to call sinners to repentance so there us world is full of sinners but he didn't come to call all of them he said i have come to call sinners to repentance to give up their sins so the only people jesus came to call are those who want to be free from the sin they see in their life So if they don't see sin in their life then of course there's no possibility of their being saved. See in uh, Matthew's gospel chapter 9 Matthew 9 and uh, we read in verse 12 no pharisees verse 11 said why is your teacher eating with the tax collectors and the sinners and jesus said it's not those who are healthy who need a physician but those who are sick but go and learn what this means i desire compassion and not sacrifice for i did not come to call the righteous but sinners So we know that throughout his life Jesus the person who prepared the way for John Jesus was John the Baptist and it says he came to pave the way for Christ to come and the main message of John the Baptist was repent so without that you cannot accept Christ so the only person who can repent is one who is serious about who seriously discovers that so much sin in his life so i feel that today so many people in many particularly those from nominal christian backgrounds 
They, they've come to Christ without first of all realizing that they're sinners. It's like somebody dragging you to a doctor and you don't believe you're sick. If you don't realize you're sick, then you're not going to take seriously what the doctor says. See, if you don't believe that you got cancer and the doctor prescribes a treatment, you're not going to take it. And that is the condition of many, many people who are sitting in Christian churches today. The Christian church has become like a club, nice club to belong to. You don't have to pay any price, you just sit there. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to make it clear to all such people, you are not born again. And you will see in the day of judgment that my words are true. And it'll be too late. It's better to realize it now. That's why I want to really make it clear because I don't want anybody's blood on my hands. Paul said in Acts chapter 20, he said, Acts 20, he said, everywhere, verse 21, Acts 20, verse 21, I preach repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, I tell people to turn from their sin. That's the first thing Paul preached everywhere and then believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So as I have said for years and years and years that repentance is one of the missing messages in today's Christianity. And because people are not told to turn from their sin, they're not really born again. You cannot be born again if you don't come to Jesus recognizing, not just recognizing, everybody in the world recognizes they are sinners, but wanting to be free from your sin. If you are not fed up with your sinful life, you really can't be born again. Like I've said to many people who want to join our church, I say, please don't come and join our church if you're not fed up with your own sinful life. Go and join some other church. There are so many churches in the world. Why you want to come here and waste our time and defile all the others with your worldliness? Uh, you just want a comfortable place to sit and make friends with people or somebody who's something like that. We don't want such people. We want people who are fed up with their own sinful life and who are longing to be free from sin in their life, who are crying out to God, Lord, I'm fed up of this sin and that sin and the other sin. And if that type of cry is not in your heart, I want to tell you, you're sitting in the wrong place. This is not the place for you. Please find another church because you are polluting this church. You're hindering the witness of the church with your worldliness. New people come in and you speak all your worldly stuff to them and pollute them. We don't want such people and we're going to gradually eliminate such people from this church because we want people who are fed up with their sin and who are crying out to God, not only in the meeting, but at home, say, Lord, I see sin in my life. I want to be free from it. I want to be free from it. That is the mark. Those are the only people Jesus came for. So he says, I preach repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says in the last part, I, I, I have proclaimed to you, verse 27, the whole purpose of God, not part of it. Therefore, verse 26, I am innocent of the blood of all men. A preacher who preaches repentance and preaches against sin and the whole purpose of God, his hands will be free from guilt. But any preacher who does not preach against sin, when people in his church go to hell, he will be guilty also. I believe that. That's what Paul says. How can Paul become guilty, verse 26, of the blood of other people? He says, I'm innocent of the blood of all men because, verse 27, I have declared the whole purpose of God. I can say that. Everywhere I've gone, I've declared the whole purpose of God. A lot of people got offended. It bothers me the least. Because I'm not here to please man. I'm here only to please God. 
And so, it doesn't disturb me if some people are offended with me. They were offended with Jesus, they were offended with Paul, they were offended with every servant of God in the history of Christianity, except the men pleasers and the money lover preachers. All the others, people are offended with because they don't, pe most people don't like to hear the truth about themselves. But it's only those who love the truth who can be saved. So, if, we, if you don't love the truth about yourself, it's very difficult to be saved. And the great danger is that when we don't love the truth and we hear the truth and it doesn't disturb us, we can sit comfortably and listen to the truth and be completely unchanged. The great danger is that God himself will deceive you. Turn with me to what I call the most scary verse in the New Testament, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The most scary verse in the New Testament is not that you can go to hell, no. The most scary verse in the New Testament is that God himself will deceive you. It says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that Satan comes with the deception, verse 10, Satan comes with the deception of wickedness for those who perish, for those who are going to hell. Because, why are they deceived? He's talking about verse 10, please see the activity of Satan who comes with false signs and wonders and with the deception, all the deception of wickedness for those who perish, for those who go to hell, because, why did they get deceived? Because they did not love the truth so as to be saved. They did not love the truth that they heard to be saved from sin. And when God sees that, here is a person who is sitting in some church and coming to some meeting and does not receive the truth does not love the truth to be saved from sin, you know what God does? See what God does. God himself will send on them a deceiving influence so that they may believe what is false. Can you imagine God trying to deceive you? That's what it says here. If God deceives you, you will be thoroughly deceived and deceived means you think you're saved when you're not saved. You think you're born again when you're not born again. Because not only the devil is deceiving you, God is deceiving you. There's no hope. The devil is already a deceiver. He's called a deceiver of the whole world. My only hope is that God is on my side and prevents me from being deceived. But here it says, if I don't love the truth, God also will deceive me. And when God deceives me, it says here that I will believe what is false. Can you imagine God who loves the truth wanting me to believe what is false? That means I will believe I'm born again when I'm not born again. That is believing what is false. And who makes me believe that? God. Why? Because I don't love the truth. I don't love the truth about myself. It, that's why I say this is the most scary verse in the New Testament. I never want it. And so, what is the way to escape it? Very simple. Just two things. Both are mentioned in verse 10. I must love the truth. When God speaks to my heart, I must face up to it and say, Lord, it is true. I'm guilty. And secondly, Again, verse 10, I must be desiring to be saved from my sin. So if I love the truth about myself when God shows it to me, and I'm eager to be saved from my sin, I will never be deceived. And I decided that many years ago. And that's how God has shown me so many things in my own life through the years. You see, my flesh is exactly the same as your flesh. My flesh is the same as the flesh of Osama bin Laden or the suicide bombers. My flesh is the same. 
If any of you think you are better than a suicide bomber, you don't have any understanding about your flesh. I'm convinced my flesh is… I came from Adam. That suicide bomber came from Adam too. He's got the same flesh as me. Maybe my background and my upbringing protected me from some of the evils he does, but inwardly my flesh is the same. Once you recognize that, you'll see what corruption there is in your flesh. Paul said, in my flesh that doesn't dwell one single good thing. See that verse in Romans chapter 7. See, what I'm trying to say is, unless you see how terrible your condition is, you'll never want to be born again. You'll never want to be saved. You'll go, you'll go with a superficial type of Christianity and you'll deceive yourself in your whole life that you're saved when you're not saved. And I say, I don't want to be responsible for that. So wherever I go, I want to make absolutely sure that I've made the truth clear. It's like a doctor giving a scan to a person saying, you got a terrible cancer and it'll kill you. After that, my responsibility is over. After that, it's the other person's responsibility whether he wants to be delivered from it or not, not mine. But if I don't make that clear, then I am responsible before God. And I will, that's what Paul says, I'm free from the blood of everybody because I've told people the truth. So, Romans 7, he says in verse 18, he says, I know something and I believe all of us must know this. I know that nothing good dwells in me, in my flesh. How many of you believe that, honestly? I'm not talking about trying to be spiritual and quoting the right words and all that. You know, a lot of people in prayer say, I'm such a wretch and all that. They don't really mean it. Because if they ever heard somebody else call them a wretch, they'd be upset. But they themselves call themselves a wretch in prayer. So, how many of you really, you've you got to face up to this verse. Can you say, I know, not I have heard, I know. Like as clear as, do you know you're a man? Do you know you're a woman? You don't have any doubt about it? You're a boy, you're a girl, you don't have any doubt about it? In the same way, you know that in your flesh, there is not one single good thing. I'm just quoting scripture. The Apostle Paul said, I know that is in my flesh, there is nothing good in the flesh of that terrorist, suicide bomber, there's nothing good. Do you realize that you are just the same as that person in your flesh? No difference. Maybe your background, upbringing, religion kept you from certain evil things, so you look better than that person, but you look inside, it's just the same. You take a scan of that terrorist's heart and scale a scan of your heart, it's 100% the same. I believe it. I have seen clearly in my flesh dwells no good thing. And because I've seen that, I have longed for a complete salvation from sin in my life. And that's why God's given it to me progressively. But if you don't see it, you will not desire it. Can you get a man on the operating table who doesn't believe he's got cancer? No. You have to drag him there and he won't come. He won't sign the certificate that's required before surgery because he says, I don't believe I've got, I don't believe I'm that bad. That guy's got cancer but not me. That terrorist has got it but not me. Well then, if I've experienced a salvation, it's because I believe my flesh is the same as any terrorist or suicide mom or anybody. And if you don't believe that, my brother, sister, let me tell you the truth. I don't care which church you sit in. You will not experience the full salvation from sin and your experience with Jesus will always be shallow. You'll always wonder, why can't I get to this wonderful life that some people have? I'll tell you why. Because you didn't start where they started. They started with knowing that in their flesh there was nothing good. They were absolutely convinced. They're, got fifth stage of cancer, there's no hope for them and that's how they got saved. But maybe you come along and you think you're a little good Christian. I remember once in, uh, at the end of one church service, one couple came up to me and they were not really saved, they were nominal Christians. And I told them, 
I said, I can discern that you're not saved because you're coming to Jesus as Christians. And let me tell you the truth that Jesus did not die for Christians. He died for sinners. You come to him as a rotten, good-for-nothing sinner, he will save you. You come to him as a Christian, you'll be lost eternally. Yeah, you know that I speak straight. I speak straight because I don't want anybody's blood on my hand. So understand this, my brothers. If I want everyone here. I can't save all of you. I can't ensure that all of you are born again. That I cannot do. That you have to decide yourself. But I can make the truth clear so that nobody is in doubt as to what it really means to be born again to become a child of God, to come into fellowship with the Father. And it begins with knowing that in my flesh dwells nothing good. Now what happens is, you know, when you discover that, you don't look down on anybody. How can I look down on someone if I realize that his flesh is the same as mine? Can one fellow who is living in a slum look down on another fellow who lives in a slum. If you're living a decent place, you can look down on a person who lives in a slum, but a person who's in the slum himself can't look down on another person who lives in a slum. And if you look down on another person, it proves that you don't think you're as bad as him. And that would be an indication of whether you're really saved or not. I'll tell you honestly. So one of the first questions you need to ask yourself is, do you look down on somebody? Do you feel, I thank you, I'm not like them? You don't have to say it, but in your heart, if you think like that, it would be one clear indication that you don't really believe that your flesh, there's nothing good. See, I'm really trying to take you through a kindergarten lesson. This is the kindergarten lesson, to be born again. And if you turn with me to Luke chapter 18, you see everything I said is in scripture. Jesus told a parable, verse 9, listen to this, to those, he didn't say this for everybody, he said this to those who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and looked at others with a certain degree of contempt. Are you like that? Do you feel you're holy and you look down on some others who are not as holy as you are? This is parable is for such people. It's not for everybody. It's for those who think I'm okay. That guy is not. Two men went up to the temple to pray, verse 10, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Tax collectors in those days were always classified with prostitutes. Tax collector men and women prostitutes were in the same category, the worst sinners because every tax collector was a crook who cheated and robbed people of money and every prostitute was an immoral woman. So. Many, many times in the Gospels you read about tax collectors and harlots, tax collectors and prostitutes, tax collectors and prostitutes. They were the worst sinners of all. So these two people went to pray and I don't know whether you've noticed this. Many Christians have not noticed what it says here because we don't read the Bible carefully. To whom did the Pharisee pray? That's the first question. Read it in verse 11. He prayed to himself. He thought he was praying to God, but he was praying to himself. Does anybody pray to himself? A lot of people pray to themselves. They're not praying to God. Many people who even confess their sin, oh Lord, I'm a sinner, they don't really believe it. Like I told you, they may say, oh Lord, I'm such a wretch. On the, another day they hear somebody else saying so-and-so is a wretch and they get upset. Why do they get upset? You said to God a little while ago that you're a wretch. 
You don't believe it. If you believed it and somebody else said you were a wretch, you'd say that's right. What he said was right. But we say these words that look very humble, particularly in public prayer, so that we get a reputation for humility. That's how the Pharisee was praying to himself. And what was he thinking? So we can say that he was really thinking like this in his heart. That's what's the meaning of praying to himself. How do you pray to yourself? You're thinking like that, God. You're saying God, but you're praying to yourself. I think a lot of people who pray in public don't really pray to God. I'll tell you honestly. When I was a young Christian, born again, I was going to a church and then I heard people praying in public and I also started praying. And almost every time I was praying to myself. Because when I prayed, I wasn't conscious of Jesus in that room. I was conscious that all these people are listening to my prayer. So I must pray in an impressive way. They mustn't think I'm useless. I must pray in a way that will impress them. I must impress them with my humility. So I must say, oh God, I'm such a wretch, I'm a rotten sinner. I must say all the right words, you know, the right, right words are, I'm such a wretch, I'm a rotten sinner. And I then quote the right language from scripture, oh, thank you that your blood will cleanse me. And Now, I'm not asking you to judge other people's prayer. If you judge other people's prayer, you're the biggest Pharisee of all. Judge yourself. I'm not saying this to judge other people. I do not judge other people's prayer. I say, Lord, maybe he's sincere, I don't know. But I know in my case, when I was praying in the early days in public, I would pray and I was much more conscious of the people around me listening than Jesus. I was not at all conscious of Jesus. And so that didn't satisfy me. I would go back to my room, I was in the Navy those days, and I would say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. I came into your midst of your people and instead of praying to you, I prayed to myself. I prayed to exalt myself in the eyes of others so they'll realize I'm a very humble brother. Forgive me. I don't want to pray like that. I want to pray to you. So then the next week, I would pray again. Again, I'd be praying to myself. I was more conscious of the people. I'd come back home. I would repent again. Believe it or not, this went on for years, but every single time I was determined that I would come home and cleanse myself. It's like you go home and take a bath. Well, you say you had a bath yesterday, but you want to take one another today because dirt has come onto you again. And you take another bath or shower tomorrow, and then you take another shower, and it's like going for treatment. You go for, if you've got cancer, you go for chemotherapy and the doctor tests you and says, no, you've got to come again, and some more chemotherapy, and, and the doctor says, no, you still got cancer, you've got some more chemotherapy, and you keep going, keep going, keep going, till the cancer is eliminated 100%, only then you're satisfied. Nobody will be satisfied if the doctor says, ah, about 25% cancer is still there. You won't say, oh, well, that's okay, but, or 25%, I had 80%, now it's only 25%, I'm okay. You will not. When it comes to sickness, we are very serious. Doctor, I don't want to stop till it has become zero. So that's how I prayed to God. I said, Lord, I'm still, maybe not 80%, but still 25%. I'm con still praying to people, not to you. And over a period of time, over a period of time, because I kept on judging myself, I came to the place where when I prayed in public, it didn't matter if nobody was in the room, I prayed to Jesus. Not only prayed, but when I sang a song, I would sing it to Jesus. Do you, are you conscious of the words that you sing? Do you know that every song we sing is a prayer? That's another area where I didn't take seriously. I used to sing a song, you know, particularly if it's a very familiar song, which I knew the tune, I knew the words by heart. And they would sing it and I would sing, I could shut my eyes and sing it. And I would sing and sing and sing and sing and realize that, the, you know, where we 
In the olden days, we never had this projection and all, we had song books. So I, we would be singing song number something and we would sing and sing and sing and then the song is over, they go to the next hymn and suddenly I realize, hey, I wasn't even paying attention when I sang that last song. So what, ha what, what, what I would do, when all the others were singing the next song, I would turn back on the hymn book to the old song. And I'd say, I'm sorry Lord, I didn't mean these words. I did not mean these words. Please forgive me. And while the others were singing the other song, I would read the words that I had already sung. And I'd say, Lord, I want to mean it now. And I would go through that whole song and say, Lord, this time I'm meaning it. I'm not singing it, but I'm saying it to you in my heart. This is, I need thee every hour. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. Whatever it was. I, then I really meant it. So that was the time I really sang that song. The rest was like a concert, everybody singing, you join in. And as I did that a number of times, it didn't just happen once, it happened many times. I discovered that most of the time when I was singing, I wasn't really singing to God at all. I wasn't conscious of Jesus being there. Everybody singing and it's nice, it's like a rock concert, everybody singing, I'm also singing. Most of the song leaders also, they don't have a clue what they're singing. I tell you, in many, many churches, the song leaders, they, they themselves are not serious about what they're singing. They don't think of the words, it's just the tune and some shake their hips and... It's the spirit of reverence that Jesus is here and I have to, I'm saying something to him is not there. And you know what the root cause of this is? Either some people are not even born again, or they've taken their relationship with God so casually that, I mean, if, for example, if the ruler of this country was sitting right here, I think all of us would be very conscious, oh, oh the ruler of this country is here. But Jesus can be here and we're not even conscious of it. But we say we are born again. Well, those people in the other churches, dead churches, they also are not conscious of Jesus. And if we are in the same category, how do we say we are born again? How do we say we are different? How do we say we have life? We are in the same condition as those people. These are very, very serious issues, brothers and sisters. I'm only trying to help you to be delivered from deception. Love the truth then God will not deceive you. I love the truth. And the truth was I was praying to people, not to God. And so God saved me from deception. I love the truth. I said, Lord, I didn't sing this to you. I just sang it like a nice tune. I love the truth and I said it, Lord, I'm sorry. And the Lord saved me from that deception. Uh, for example, we sang a song today. Uh, mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He's trampling out where the grapes of wrath are stored. Do you remember it? Do you remember what you're saying? What does it mean? I've seen the light in a number of camps. Which camps? It's a song. Nice tune. I'm amazed at the amount of self-deception that goes on in singing. When in many churches they try to improve the quality of the singing, saying, let's sing in tune. I'm saying, let's mean what we sing, even if we don't sing in tune. If you mean what you sing, even if you don't sing in tune, God will hear you. We're not, uh, we're not training choirs here. 
We're training godly people. I don't care. I never, it never bothers me if people don't sing in tune. I'll tell you honestly. I mean, I'm not so particular if the tune is right or wrong. It's good to sing in tune, of course, so that all can sing together. Very, very important to mean what we say. Jesus once said in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, your yes must be yes, your no must be no. You know, there are songs like, all to Jesus I surrender. I wonder how many people can really sing it. But everybody will sing it. Or, uh, take my life and let it be consecrated Lord to thee. That's one of the toughest songs to sing. Because one line in it says, Take my silver and my gold, not one might will I withhold. I almost feel like smiling when I hear everybody singing that song. I know that none of them mean it. It's a nice song. I can't change the words. I'll tell you, I can't change the words, I just keep quiet. If I can't mean something, I keep quiet. Sometimes, when I come across a line in a song and I can't sing it, I don't change the words, I just keep quiet or sing it softly. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. I never sing it because I have never in my life called God Jehovah. You say, why? Isn't that his name? My four sons have never called me Mr. Poonin. Why? Isn't that my name? Why don't they come up to me and say, Mr. Poonin, can I talk to you? You know what they call me? Dad. You know what I call my father in heaven? Not Jehovah. I've never called him Jehovah. He's my dad. I call him dad. Jesus taught me to call him heavenly father. But in the Old Testament, even in the Old Testament, they were scared to use the word Jehovah. They would call him, O oh Lord, Adonai, God, Mighty. But there are songs like that. There's a very popular song nowadays in Christians. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no, I don't know how many times they say it. There's no God like Jehovah. What? What are you talking about? They have no idea what the New Testament says. Are these people born again? Do they listen to the Holy Spirit? My brothers and sisters, wake up! Many are sleeping in the church, spiritually asleep. They don't take what they say to God seriously. If you go to a court and they ask you to sign a document there in front of the judge, tell me, will you read it or not? Oh. You will not only read it, you'll get a lawyer to read it ten times. Say, please tell me, is there one word here which will commit me to something? Then only you'll sign it. Why are we so particular about a sale deed and a document and we talk to God so lightly as if he is just some person up there whom we couldn't care less for? No wonder we don't progress spiritually. No wonder year after year after year we are in the same rut I'm not scolding you. Please listen to me. I'm challenging you to get out of that rut and climb up higher because God has got fantastic plans for you. It's like if I, if I see that my son is very intelligent and he can accomplish great things in life with his intelligence but he's lazy and careless and getting 40% and 45% and happy with it. I say, son, you must not be happy with 45%. I may raise my voice and tell him, not because I'm angry, but because I say, listen, you're capable of 95%. Why are you happy with 45%? That's exactly how I'm speaking to you today. I look at all of God's people in CFC churches as my children. Not everybody, in C not all believers, they are not my responsibility. But God has given me a responsibility in CFC churches and I treat them all as my children. God is my witness. And I speak to them just like I speak to my children. I want the highest for them. I, want, I had four sons, I wanted them to do really well spiritually and really well in their 
academic studies as well. And I would push them, spiritually and academically, because I knew that that way they, they won't become beggars in the world, spiritually first. So that's exactly what I'm trying to do. So this Pharisee, he prayed to himself and he said, God, I thank you, I'm not like this guy over here, uh, this sinner over there who's praying. And it's very easy to have that attitude towards somebody in the church. Thank you, I'm not like others. God may have done a work in me that's delivered me from sin. But I can't look down upon another person who's unconverted and despise him. No, I definitely say I'm different because God has lifted me up. He, he loves sin, I hate sin. So I can't say that God has not done any work in me. That's not humility. God has done a work in me. For example, if I had cancer and some very good doctor did surgery on me and healed me completely, there's no humility in saying, oh, I've still got cancer. No, this doctor did a first class job and he healed me of cancer completely. But this guy's got cancer. I'm not despising him. I'm just telling the truth. I had the same cancer as him, but a doctor treated me and freed me from it completely. But this chap still has it. I want him to be free. So that's the only way in which I'm saying it. <clears throat> If God has done a work in us, the more the work God has done, the more humble we should be and give the glory to God. We should not deny the work God has done in us. I can, I will not deny what God has done in me. He has forgiven all my sins and for 78 years, everything I did. He looks at me today as if I've never sinned in 78 years. That's what God did in me through the blood of Jesus Christ. That I will boldly testify. I was a slave to anger. It's gone from my life. I can boldly testify. I never raise my voice at my wife even one single day of the year. Not one single moment. God has done it. I'm not taking any credit for it. I'm just saying God has done something in me. He's delivered me from some cancer. I still discover some selfishness in my life here and there, I'll tell you the truth. And as I get light on it, oh that was selfish, I want to cleanse myself. So there's a progression, I haven't become like Christ completely, no. I've got a long way to go but I find God has done a work in delivering me from certain things. He has really brought me to the place where I can rejoice in the Lord 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. I can really testify that I never get discouraged. Never, never, never. It's what God has done. But there was a time in my life when I was frequently discouraged, sitting with my head in my hands for years. So that's something God has done and I will never hesitate to give glory to God just like I saying, this doctor cured me of my cancer. What's wrong in saying that? My brothers and sisters, I say it only to tell you that there is a doctor who can cure you of your spiritual cancer. Of course, but you've got to admit that you got it first. If you keep on pretending that you don't have it, you won't be cured. So that's the difference. The other sinner in verse 13, Luke 18, 13, he was standing so far away, he was not even willing to look up to heaven. He felt, I'm such a rotten sinner, I can't even look at the face of God. And he was beating his breast and saying, Oh God, please be merciful to me. I, the New American Standard Bible, which I use, is very accurate in the way it is translated. Have you noticed this one important word there? Sometimes we don't read carefully. Have you noticed it in verse 13? Not the way you people usually understand it. God be merciful to me, a sinner. That's not what he said. You noted, did you notice the mistake I made? God be merciful to me, the sinner. Meaning, I am the only sinner in the world. I feel like I'm the only sinner in the world. Everybody's better than me. 
That's the difference between saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner, and God be merciful to me, the sinner. And when you really come before God, you feel like that. Lord, I am the sinner here. And it says, this man went to his house, declared righteous, verse 14. And I have gone to my house, declared righteous by God. Because I came to him like that. What I want to ask you is, have you come to him like that? If you have never in your life come to him like that, it's not too late to come today and say, Lord, I really want to be born again. I want to know the joy of being declared righteous by God. I want to be delivered from these sinful traits in my character which have enslaved me for so long. I want to be delivered. See, one mark of a child really being born, let me tell you a few marks of being born. First of all, a child will begin to cry. You know what doctors do if a baby is born and he doesn't cry? They spank it. That looks cruel. But it's to make that child take a breath. If it doesn't take a breath, it'll die. I know at, at least a couple of young ladies in CFC Bangalore today who are alive today because my wife happened to be in the delivery room when they were born as babies and they were not breathing. They were blue and my wife pumped and pumped I don't know what oxygen or whatever it is till they began to breathe. They are grown up young ladies today. It's very important to breathe as soon as you're born. It's one mark of a healthy baby. And one mark of a born again person is you want to pray to God. That's breathing is prayer. You immediately discover you're a father and you want to talk to him. A person who doesn't talk to God is like a baby that doesn't breathe. And you know babies can be born and they can be breathing and they are healthy and sometimes one month later the baby dies or one year later the baby dies. That can also happen. They stop breathing. I've seen people like that, born again, really born again. They really turned to the Lord and they started praying and then you see these so same people two, three years later, they've stopped praying. They don't pray anymore. They've stopped breathing. What happened? I thought you were a healthy baby. Yeah, you were a healthy baby, but you know there are babies who are born healthy, three years later they're dead. So this person was really born again, but died spiritually. So that's one mark of being born again. You breathe. Another mark of being born again is of a birth is what we read in 1 Peter chapter 2 is it says in verse 2 like newborn babes 1 Peter 2 verse 2 long for the pure milk of the word of God. If a baby does not cry for milk, again, something's wrong. Not just breathing. But a baby will... You know, when a little baby cries in a house, even a dumb man like me can know it's crying for milk. <laughs> Mother knows immediately. What does a baby cry for? It's not crying for anything else, it's crying for milk. A newborn baby, if it cries, it's crying for milk. And it'll keep on crying till it gets it. You try to pat it down and say, stop crying, stop crying. It will not stop crying. That's the way you know a baby is healthy. 
It's crying for milk. I'm thirsty, I'm thirsty, give me something. I know it happened to me when I was born again 58 years ago. I suddenly began to have a love for the Bible which I never had before. I was born in a Christian family, go to church, Sunday school. I never loved to read the Bible. I'd read it, namesake, okay, I've got to read something, close it and get on with other things which are more important. But I didn't have a cry in my heart for the milk of the word of God, like newborn babes long for the milk. So if you find a baby, it, it was breathing okay when it was born, but you find after one or two days, it's not crying for milk, it's just lying quietly, happy, in the cradle, whole twenty-four hours, never crying for any milk. I tell you, even if you are a dumb father, you'll be concerned. Why is this baby not crying for milk? Two days gone by, it never cried for milk. The milk of the word of God. That's another mark that you're really born again. You want to read the Bible. You want to hear God speak to you. In the same way that a baby cries for milk. Why does a baby cry for milk? Just to ease its conscience? Ah, babies are supposed to cry for milk. Okay, ah, 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 give me some milk. Okay, done. To read the word of God like that? I was told in church that I must read the Bible every day. Okay, I've got to read the Bible. That's not crying. It is just a ritual. Now why am I saying that? Because that's how many Christians read the Bible. They're taught, you must cry for milk, okay? You're born again, you must cry for milk. Okay, here. Well, how much should I cry? A little bit of milk at least. Okay, here. That's not a real new birth. I want to tell you the truth. I believe a lot of people who think they are born again are not born again. They don't breathe. They don't cry for milk. How do you know they are born again? The other thing is, a baby, if it's really healthy, will grow. It says in 1 Peter 2, 2, that you may grow. That's another thing. If you find a baby is not growing, <laughs> it's the same size after one year, same four and a half pounds, one and a half kilos, born one and a half kilos, now also one and a half kilos. Something is wrong. If there's no growth, evaluate yourself. Many of you have babies, children. Many of you are fathers and mothers. Would you have been concerned if you saw your children never growing, even after one year? Would you be concerned? You'd be terribly concerned. Are you just as concerned when you don't see yourself growing spiritually? You feel there's something wrong, there's this death, a spiritual death that has come in? Definitely, if a, you know, sometimes in the womb, a baby can die in the womb. And the doctor says it's not growing, something's wrong, it's dead. All living things grow, only dead things don't grow. A rock will be the same size for 5,000 years. A plant, in one month it will be big. Growth is always the mark of life. If you are born again, you will grow. I don't want to make a big list. But I told you, a, baby, a healthy baby will cry, it will want milk and it will grow. Just think of those three areas, that's enough. Why am I saying this? Because the Bible uses such examples of, uh, I showed you here, it longs for milk, 1 Peter 2, 2, and it grows. Let me show you the verse where it says, the baby cries, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and verse 15. 
Romans 8.15 where it says, You have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons, which we cry out, Father! That's what happens when you're born again. A cry comes from your heart, Daddy! As soon as you're born again, boy, I got a daddy in heaven. It's a wonderful thing. I was a very insecure person when I was young. And, uh, but when the Holy Spirit came into my heart and I discovered I've got a dad in heaven, it really made me strong and bold. I find so many Christians, men, who are effeminate. They behave like women, they act like women. No, woman acting like woman is good. In fact, if a woman acts like a man, something is wrong. But a man acting like a woman, he gets married and he's still like a woman, he's not the head of his house. He's scared of his wife. Do you know the Bible speaks about such people? Have you heard about such people? I'm not talking about homosexuals. Homosexuals are men who are interested in men and women who are interested in women. I'm not talking about that. That is another thing. I'm talking about effeminate. Effeminate means a man who doesn't behave like a man. See, there's a verse here in... Um, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians it says in chapter 6, the type of people who will not enter the kingdom of God. These are the people who will not enter God's kingdom. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9. Don't be in middle of that verse. Don't be deceived. Here are the people who will not enter heaven. Fornicators, those who are single people who commit sexual sin are called fornicators. Idolaters, those who worship any type of idol. It can be money. You worship money, you're an idolater. Adulterers, those are married people who commit sexual sin. And then effeminate. And then homosexuals. Homosexuals are another category. Effeminate. People who are, don't, are not bold even though they are men. And the Bible says, you know, in 1 Corinthians 15, act like men. So there is a need for us to be bold as Christians. And the apostles were not bold. You know, they were effeminate. Before Jesus rose from the dead, they were locked they were in the room, scared. And then one day they got filled with the Holy Spirit. They threw open the doors and they, the same Peter who was scared to tell a servant girl oh, saying, I don't know Jesus, don't trouble me. The same Peter got up and said to the chief priest, you are the ones who crucified Christ. How did that happen? It was just a few days earlier that he was so scared. Even before a servant girl, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's the other thing, my brothers and sisters. It's not enough to be born again. You must be filled with the Holy Spirit. I remember that's what I began to seek because I found that even though I had received Christ, I was not bold to be a witness for Christ. I was bold in the church meetings with the others, but outside I was not bold. I was scared to let other people know that I'm a Christian. Now, I'm not talking about going out into the streets and witnessing in a place like this. If it's against the law, we don't do it. That's, I'm not talking about that. But if I'm ashamed to let people know that I'm a Christian. I know, I remember some families in the early days in CFC Bangalore. 
they'd be very zealous in witnessing and all that. Then school holidays would come and they would go to visit their unconverted relatives and they would backslide. One month of backsliding because they are with unconverted relatives. Always useless conversation and useless TV programs and then come back and they have to repent. Oh, we are backslidden. It was to happen every year. You know what such people needed? To be filled with the Holy Spirit. So that even if you are in the midst of unconverted relatives, you make it clear to them. I'm a disciple of Jesus Christ. I'm not interested in the things you're interested in. Sorry. I'm not interested in that useless conversation. I'm not interested in making fun of my neighbors and all the other people in the church. And I'm not interested in the useless gossip. And I'm not interested in watching this filthy TV program you're watching or that movie. You have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, you'll be a compromiser. You'll be a compromiser just like them. And you will go where they go. Even if you come to CFC. Dear brothers and sisters, take it seriously. Determine. I mean, if you had, if the doctor said to you one day, <clears throat> I think there's one percent chance that you got cancer. One percent you got cancer. Will you sleep peacefully? I don't think you will. He didn't say 40 percent. He said one percent. He said, doctor, please do a thorough scan, do every possible test, I'll spend any amount of money. Please tell me that it is zero. Do you believe that being free from cancer is more important than being free from hell? I mean, are we so stupid? I would never want to be in doubt that I'm saved. I would never want to be in doubt that any of my children are saved. I don't want to tell the people in the church that my children are saved and baptized. What is their opinion worth? Nothing. I want to be absolutely sure that every member of my family is really a child of God. Because I don't want to be in heaven and spend eternity and see one of my children burning in hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Whatever, um, however good I may have been to them on earth, if I finally see them in hell, I have been a useless father. Maybe I educated them, did everything else, but I'm not even concerned. Some parents say, brother, what to do? I'll tell you what to do. Pray. Miss some meals and fast and pray. You would do that if the doctor diagnosed your son or daughter with cancer. Why don't we pray just as much when your son or daughter is wayward and not converted and on his way to hell and you don't even fast and pray? I don't believe that such people are born again. I don't believe the parents are born again. They can see their child going to hell. It's like seeing your child about to fall over a cliff and you don't stop him. You see your child fall, about to fall over a cliff and you don't stop him? Dear brothers and sisters, we have to take this much, much more seriously than we have done. And if I have woken you up to a little bit of seriousness in this area, I've done my job. I'm a servant of the Lord. God's given me a commission. And I'm going to be faithful to that, particularly to my flock. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray with all my heart that every single person sitting here will take what they have heard from you seriously. I don't know their condition, you know because you know the secret thoughts and attitudes of persons. And I pray, Lord, and I know that my prayer will not solve the problem if they don't take action themselves. But I really want everybody here to be saved. I don't want to see any of these people whom I meet here to be burning in hell one day. And so, even if they are offended, I have to speak the truth. Please help everyone to Take this matter seriously. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.